and welcome to this week's episode of Composer Tea, where we spill the tea of a composer of my choice. And with me is my co-host Kitty, and he does nothing. He's been good though. It's kind of dreary out today, so the lighting's all weird. But that makes it a perfect day for some tea to be spilled. Today, we are going to be speaking about John Cage. John Cage was an American composer. He had a very experimental style, like very experimental. And his compositions changed the history of music and they challenged audiences to think about what is music and what is not music. You gotta think about it. His most famous piece is a piece called 4 minutes and 33 seconds, and he was a Virgo. It's not really that important, but the more you know. So let's talk a little bit about this man's childhood. He was born in 1912 in Los Angeles. His dad, whose name was also John Cage, John Cage Sr., he was an inventor, except for his dad never patented his inventions, so he used to invent invent different things or like different improvements on things. But because they were never patented, he never got money from those things. So the family grew up poor and they often had to move from house to house to house and in low-income housing, so they were moving a lot within the Los Angeles area during John Cage's childhood. And his mom was a journalist for the Los Angeles Times. Later on, John Cage described his mother as a woman with a sense of society. And then he also said about her that she was never happy. John Cage's first experiences with music were when he was in the fourth grade and he started taking piano lessons. And he wasn't interested in being a virtuoso, like that didn't really appeal to him, but he really, really enjoyed sight reading. It was so much fun to him. I enjoy sight reading, so I totally get that. He actually, when he was younger, like a kid, he wanted to be a writer when he grew up. And his mom was a journalist, so I'm sure that had some kind of influence on him. He graduated from Los Angeles High School, and he was valedictorian of his class. And after high school, he went on to college and he enrolled as a theology major. Oh, are you, is it time? Do you need to depart? It's okay. I love you. It's time. If you go to study theology, it's the study of religion. And that's because he decided when he went to college that he wanted to be a Methodist minister. And I would definitely describe him at this point in time in his life. So he was like, what, 18? I would definitely say he was a free spirit. And he got to college and he realized very quickly that he didn't like it. And he didn't like it because he thought it was too institutionalized. He went to high school and all the other things he had to do up until that point and like, everybody has to go to the school. It's the law. At least in Florida it is. I don't know about other states. But I think he was expecting something different by the time he got to college. And it wasn't what he wanted. There's a story of he was taking, I guess it was a language arts class or an English class. And he goes into the library and he sees all these other people that I'm assuming are in the same class as him. And they're all reading the same exact book. They're all doing the same exact thing. And he was like, I don't, I don't like that. And he's like, okay, well, I'm just gonna pick a book. So he goes to the library in the section of whatever it is he's supposed to be reading. And he goes to the last name of the authors and he goes to the Z section of last name of authors and he just picks the first author with the last name of a Z that he finds and he reads it and then he turns in the paper off of this book that he reads and he gets the highest grade in the class and he didn't really try. And that's when he kind of realized, 
I, I don't like this. This is not for me. So he dropped out because it just wasn't for him. And sometimes college isn't for everybody. So instead, what he realized was, I need an education, but I need it in a different way than the traditional institutional way that people see education. So he decided that he was gonna go travel to Europe and he convinced his parents to let him just go to Europe and just be there and do his European thing. But he really thought like that would be the most beneficial to him is to actually see a bit of the world. So during this time, he did study stuff in Europe. He didn't go to a college per se, but he did actively pursue different things and had different teachers. So while he was there in Europe, he studied painting, poetry, and one of the other things he studied was music. While he was there in Europe for the very first time, he started to learn about Bach and he was learning just all different things and he was listening to the music and taking it in and he had never experienced anything like that before. He had never heard of Bach. Can you imagine a world without Bach? No cello suites? Also, while he was there and studying music, he also saw concerts and performances and there were pieces by Stravinsky and Hindemith and they at the time were more modern composers and he got to thinking while he was there that not a lot in a way has changed in music in that sense. If you think of Bach and you're looking at the things that he composed, we would now look at that as being very traditional. But then if you look at what Stravinsky and maybe some other modern composers were doing at the time, they were modern, but in a way, not a lot had changed with the orchestra. Were there different forms? Were there different instruments? Were there different chords that were being used? Absolutely. But it, in a way, it was still kind of the same thing, even though there was more of a modern twist to it now. You wanna come back on? Come on. There you go. Good boy. Who comes back? So he came to the conclusion after seeing and studying these different composers that music didn't really have to be what people always thought music should be in the traditional sense. And he thought maybe it could be something even more than what we considered to be modern music at this point. He moves back to California. He's done traveling and seeing the world. And he starts taking composition lessons with Arnold Schoenberg. Schoenberg was another famous composer, but he had a very, very modern style. Schoenberg developed something that was called the 12 tone technique. Now, without getting too far down this rabbit hole of what that is, because you're gonna walk out the other end of that rabbit hole and think, I don't know what music is anymore. I'm not joking. The 12 tone technique is a technique that ensures that all 12 notes of a chromatic scale are being played as often as one another or equally in the piece and it prevents the emphasis of any one note. So if at this point you're like, what did she just say? Yeah, that's how I felt when I first learned about it too. It's okay. Composers either loved it and they embraced it or they absolutely hated it. Oh, also, this is a tea called Tulsi tea or like, it's like an Indian tea. It's also named Holy Basil. Holy Basil! It's actually really yummy. I do like it. Anyways, so Cage studied with Arnold Schoenberg and who did the 12-tone technique like a lot for two years. However, they definitely had differing opinions when it came to music composition. Schoenberg was very modern, which John Cage liked. However, with his style of composing with the 12-tone technique, there's a lot of 
rules and structure. And if you don't follow those rules and structure, it doesn't work. But Cage being the free spirited man that he was, didn't really agree with all these rules and structure. And he was the type of person that kind of felt like rules were made to be broken. Such a rebel. So it came to the point after two years of lessons where Schoenberg told Cage, you are never going to succeed as a composer because you have no sense of harmony. Basically, that means you're not following these rules. And according to Schoenberg, harmony would be the wall through which Cage would not pass. And John Cage was like, in that case, I will devote my life to beating my head against that wall. Can you imagine saying that to your teacher? Don't talk to me like that. In the end, it's not like they didn't like each other or anything. Schoenberg still respected Cage as a composer and vice versa. They just had differing opinions on what music should be. So after these two years, uh, John Cage, who's probably like 23, 24 or so, he got married. And then a few years later, he and his wife moved to Seattle. He worked at the Cornish School as a dance accompanist. This was a time where he made a lot of the friendships that he would have for the rest of his life. And he got his first really big hit of fame by composing different kind of percussion pieces. But he also made an instrument and it's known as the prepared piano. So basically it's a normal piano, but on the inside of the piano, like if you were to lift the lid, the strings had non-music items attached to them or wedged in between them. And there were things like uh, different bolts or he would have erasers or little knickknacks he would find because if you hit the piano key, something was blocking the vibration of the string. So it would actually make more of a percussion kind of sound. And because he had all these different strings in the piano, he can alter each one to be different. And that like was fascinating to him because suddenly it was something that any pianist could play, but it wasn't going to sound like a traditional piano anymore. It was actually going to sound like a percussion ensemble, but anybody could do it and it would just be one person playing it actually a really interesting concept. I'm actually going to be linking uh, down below one of his sonatas that he did with the prepared piano and I want to do that so you can see and hear what that would be like because in this particular video they actually show the strings and like all the different things that would have been attached to it and what does that sound like when you do that. I actually kind of like it. What sir? You ready to come up here again? Yep, you can come up here. So many appearances in this video. Oh, there you go. You're a good boy. So after that, he spent about like five years in Seattle or so. And so now he's like in his late 20s. And he and his wife, they first moved to Chicago. And there weren't very many opportunities in Chicago like he thought there was going to be. So soon after that, he and his wife moved to New York City. And for a while there, they had to stay in different friends' apartments. They were sleeping on the floor a lot. During this time, he met a lot of other artists and composers, which was cool. But at the same time, he was burning some bridges. That's not cool. And at one point in time, he and his wife were homeless. So he didn't like have housing for a while because he was just kind of bumming off of his friends for a place to sleep essentially and people just kicked him out after a while. The other thing was there wasn't always work for him. Not everyone appreciated his work and really saw what he saw as being amazing and new. It wasn't always very well received, so he had a hard time finding a job. So I would actually consider this to be kind of a disturbing time for him because he kind of had a midlife crisis. 
I don't know if I'd call it the midlife crisis because he's definitely like in his early 30s, late 20s. But he was going through some stuff. It was getting a little heavy. So during this time, his wife divorced him. But I can kind of see why for a couple different reasons. So obviously there was the uh, uncertainty of their life. He wasn't always working. They were homeless at one point. But then, here's some tea. When John Cage was in New York, he realized he was falling in love with one of the choreographers that he had always worked with and that he had met back in Seattle. The person's name was Merce Cunningham. And after John Cage's wife divorced him, he and Merce were actually together for the rest of John Cage's life. That was his partner. And I don't know how long this was going on for. Was this marriage a little bit rocky this entire time then from Seattle to New York? I don't know, but my guess is yes. Another thing that was going on that was kind of heavy for him, maybe a little bit of a problem, was World War II was going on. So John Cage's parents had actually moved to New Jersey at this point, which is really close to New York City. His dad was hired by the US government to work on submarine detection stuff, which, I mean, they used submarines back then, so that was like an important part of the war. So John Cage was hired by his dad to work in a library and find research for his dad. I'm sure he didn't like that too much. It's probably not what he wanted to do, but he also had to make a living. So that's one of the ways he did that. And because the work he was doing was considered to be work for the government and towards the war, he didn't have to go into the draft like many Americans did at that time. Now you're probably like, wow, he's got it pretty easy. All he has to do is go to a library and do some research and he didn't even have to fight in the war. Yes, he's very lucky in that way. And I'm sure he realized that. I think that war time for everybody in the world was World War II after all. It was just heavy. And I think it took its toll on many Americans. And so if you're going through a divorce and it's war time, and you don't have a fulfilling job at the time. The last thing was his artistic life as a composer was not going well. The public did not really like his stuff. I mean, still today, there are people that don't really like his stuff, but that went both ways. Not only did the public and other composers really not like his stuff, but he also didn't really like the stuff that other people were listening to or other people were composing. And a lot of times there's that idea of music being a way to communicate with anybody and that it's a way to bring people together. And that's something that you would hear a lot during this time, during this war time. But that wasn't a thing for him because he didn't like the music that was coming out and that really upset him. So he was feeling underappreciated as an artist and he just didn't fit in to this world. So this just wasn't a good time in his life. And this whole thing lasted for about five years or so. So after all the stuff in his life had been happening, there was at one point in time, he said that he felt like he had been rescued. He started going to a series of Zen Buddhism lectures and workshops. And he was starting to, in his life, really embrace the teachings of Zen Buddhism. And they were kind of teaching him on the flow of life. And he kind of started making connections to this and how not only it's helping him in his life, but how it could also apply to his music. And it was just something that kind of just clicked with him. It just made sense. And I'm kind of happy that that happened to him because if you're having such a heavy time in your life and you found something that is working for you and that it's bringing you joy, that makes me happy to hear that. So after 
learning about Zen Buddhism and adopting a new mind frame, Cage decided that the problem with Western music, especially like Western European music at this point, is that the ego of the composer is what's getting in the way of the music. Now you're like, the ego? So ego is like the self-esteem, the self-importance, self-identity. That's what's getting in the way of different composers' music. So he was beginning to think and have these ideas that music should just be and it should there shouldn't be any purpose to it it should just happen however with all these ideas that's great john cage but it's kind of hard to compose music without a certain sense of purpose in mind for the piece so about another five years go by so what is he in like his late 30s now or something like that he's given a copy of a text that's called I Ching. I Ching is a very old text, like 136 BC old. And it's a classic Chinese text that describes a symbol system. They use that to identify order, like to make sense of something in chance events. So like random events, like anything could have happened, it tries to make sense of them or it helps the reader do that. So this gave Cage an idea. He was like, what if I write music completely by chance? That way, the ego of the composer isn't involved at all. Hmm. So what he did was based on this text after reading it, he made different charts with blocks of music. And on these blocks and charts, there were different sounds and not all of these sounds were instrument sounds or musical notes. They could have been like the sound the microwave makes. Bing! I know that sound. Or like a car horn or something. If there were instruments, there could have been instruments, different dynamics, different tempos. All of those different musical elements had blocks and charts. So then he would make music or compose music by assembling these different blocks and charts and then he would flip a coin so he would have essentially a 50 50 chance and then once the coin landed on whatever it landed on he would then refer back to this i ching book to see what should happen what does the book say i should do so he didn't decide I want this to be in 3-4 time and in the key of A major. He didn't decide that at all. Chance did. The coin did. Everything was made purely by chance. Essentially, all he was doing was just recording the outcome of it through a musical piece. I'm going to attach in the description box a piece called Imaginary Landscape Number no. 4. It uses 12 radios and 24 people to do this chance piece and you're going to listen to it and you're going to think to yourself what in the world did i just listen to sounds like a bunch of racket it, it kind of just sounds like noise it's nothing well i don't want to say nothing but you will literally ask the question to yourself what did i listen to but that is actually exactly the question he wants you to ask what am i listening to i know that sounds like really artsy but he's definitely pushing those boundaries of what is composing music. And part of the reason he's done this is because essentially music by definition is sounds that are combined in different ways and they produce a form. And there's different forms of music and we've talked about some of those. There's symphonies and concertos and string quartets and list goes on forever. Technically, you should listen to that piece. It checks all of the boxes and he meets all of the criteria of what music is in that piece. There are definitely some sounds. They might not be the traditional musical sounds that we are used to in Western music, 
but they're definitely still sounds nonetheless. And they are combined in a specific way. It's just the way that they happen to be combined happen to be by chance. And it doesn't say like how they have to be combined. So technically, by definition, that recording that you should go listen to is music. Do you have to like it? No, you are allowed to have your own opinion about it. But he is challenging you as the listener to think outside the box. Do you get it? To think outside the box. That joke works all the time. And this brings us to his most famous piece, four minutes and 33 seconds. In Zen Buddhism, there is an emphasis on incorporating the opposites of things. They call it yin and yang. Cage kind of made a correlation between silence and sound. And he became like very interested in this concept. So there was one time he was visiting Harvard and he got to go into an anechoic chamber. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a very specialized designed room made by engineers. And it's made so that the ceiling and the floor and the walls and everything, they absorb all sounds that are being made. And also on the outside of this room, it's soundproofed so that no sounds can actually get into the room as well. I wish my house was anechoic. So even something like uh, hearing footsteps going across the room or anything, it's not gonna happen because there's nothing for those sound waves to bounce off of because the walls and everything just absorbs it. I don't know how, it's just a bunch of science stuff. Don't ask me that question. I just know that it's a thing. So if you went into one of these things, the concept is you're not gonna hear anything. So anyways, he because he's interested in like studying and exploring more about silence versus sounds, he is able to go into one of these rooms and he's in there for a little bit, but he keeps hearing two different noises. And he's like, what? So the first one is he keeps hearing this high pitched like hum sound like I'm assuming that's what the sound sounded like. And then the other sound he keeps hearing is like a low pulse. Like you're in a club. Boom, 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 boom. You know you want to go dancing with me. So he gets out of this room and he talks to the engineer. He's like, yo, your room is broken. I'm hearing things. Uh, in real life, you probably shouldn't say that statement to anyone. And the engineer goes back and he's like, oh no, 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 nothing's wrong with the room. The two things you're hearing is your own nervous system working and that's what that high pitch sound is. And then the other thing is your heartbeat. So you're actually able to hear your heartbeat because there's no other sounds in this room. Isn't that cool? Science. So this gave John Cage an idea and he kind of thought about it. He was like, oh my gosh, silence is never really silent. So he composed a piece that is called four minutes and 33 seconds. And this can be performed by a number of different kinds of instruments or combinations of instruments or any type of ensemble. However, the original was meant for solo piano. So in the original piece, the way it was written, the pianist would come on stage, set the music on the piano, and then they would set a stopwatch for four minutes and 33 seconds. And then the pianist would then sit in silence for a while. After the first movement was finished, he might walk around and adjust the piano lid because the piano lid like kind of controls how loud or soft things are on the piano. And then he'd sit back down and the next movement would begin, but he would just sit there and then he'd get up and do it again. And he'd sit for the third movement. And when the stopwatch went off, he would then stand up, bow to the audience 
and then walk off the stage. So essentially it's an entire song of silence with three movements in it. If you're gonna do this with an orchestra, which has been done, the conductor would then come out, take a bow, set a timer for four minutes and 33 seconds. Sometimes you would see them tune beforehand too, which like is hilarious to me. I've seen it two different ways. So sometimes the orchestra just sits in silence and the conductor would give a downbeat and then same thing for the second and the third movement. But I've also seen it sometimes where the players in the orchestra, the musicians, sometimes they're not just sitting there. Sometimes they are reading a newspaper or maybe they brought a book. Sometimes I've seen it where they're playing cards on stage, but I've seen both. Once four minutes and 33 seconds has gone on, the conductor then cuts the orchestra off, turns around, takes a bow, walks off stage. And that's it. There's no like sounds in this piece. And some people are like, where is it? So the whole point of this entire piece is to show that there is no such thing as silence. You're supposed to be listening to what's called accidental sounds. So if you're an audience member in this piece, you're listening to maybe the air conditioning's rattling or maybe there's someone coughing in the audience. Maybe you can hear somebody whispering down in the front or maybe someone's trying to get comfortable in their seat and their chairs making squeaky sounds. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of criticism surrounding this piece. Music critics were like, this is literally nothing. What just happened? A lot of it was I don't get it. And then there was another critic that said, anybody could have written that. And this is probably one of my favorite responses to a critic in the history of music is this. Yeah, but no one else did. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know why that makes me so happy to hear that. But he's not wrong. Nobody else did anything like that before. Anybody could have. John Cage is right. Silence is not silent. There will always be some kind of noise in our world. So the years go on and John Cage, he invented some more technologies and different kinds of sounds. However, it got to be about the 1970s and he had really bad arthritis and he had heart disease. So he was like, I'm gonna get super healthy. And he was considered to be in like the best health of his life at this point in time. He adopted a macrobiotic diet. So it's basically a Zen inspired diet, which you limit the amount of animal products and you eat more fruits and vegetables. You should be doing that anyways. He had stopped smoking and drinking. Again, you should not do those things anyways. And he was just like, really healthy he became like a health nut but i think he kind of also realized like i am getting older and i have a heart condition now and my joints aren't working however the week before his 80th birthday even though he was taking such good care of himself he had a massive stroke and then he had died it was really sad and for a lot of people even though he was almost 80 years old it was pretty unexpected because like he took was taking such good care of himself for like 10 years the last 10 years of his life it was like oh no this dude's gonna live forever but he didn't and sometimes it just happens so today how do we remember john cage and how did he change history first of all you're not gonna hear his stuff played in major symphony orchestras or in chamber ensembles very often. The general public doesn't really like it or appreciate his music. I don't know if I necessarily like all of it, but I definitely see what he was trying to do and therefore I can appreciate it. You should still expose yourself to new things. He definitely changed music in this last century and he opened up our eyes to a different way of looking at sounds and silence and music. He essentially invented experimental music. 
And because of him, we have other modern composers today that are with us, like Philip Glass. I really like Philip Glass. We have Laurie Anderson, Brian Eno. And if he hadn't written all these different things and pushed those boundaries of music, we wouldn't have today's experimental musicians and composers. Really, what John Cage did at the end of the day is he forced our world to look at music in a different way. I hope you enjoyed this episode as we spilled the tea on John Cage. My co-host, I think, did a pretty good job today. Why are you doing a good job, Kitty? So thank you for watching and we hope to see you next time. Bye.